I think, again, it's interesting to sort of put the context of this talk, uh, given Silas and Trey's contextualization of the current events today. But, um, you know, today I'm going to take you back in time to talk about the history of the printed ballot and how we got to this. So ballots today look boring and bureaucratic, but they are the most direct tool of participatory democracy. It's really the way we express ourselves as citizens. But these artifacts also show how the ballot was used by the parties as a tool for power and control. Uh, the ballots are really also a direct reflection of our incredibly uneven evolution of suffrage. Clearly these past months have shown that it's not an easy path and one historian called it a checkered tale of motion forward, backward, and sideways. So if this is what we recognize as a ballot today, you may not know the ballots also used to look like this from 1864, this from 1878, this from 1865, and this one from 1870, one of my favorites. Um, so clearly the recent primary election was like no other. The pandemic created a chaotic and unbelievably frustrating electoral situation where unfortunately seems likely to be apported for November, who's to say? Uh, but let's for a moment remember what voting was like before times. It used to look like this. So typically the act of voting doesn't really take that long to do. It's fairly dull, it's uneventful. You mark your ballot at this sort of rickety table. You can take your kid, you show them how democracy works and you get a sticker. But in the early days of our Republic, voting used to look like this. The typical voter profile was white, male, landowning. You would go to a schoolhouse and know everyone there. You may enjoy a free uh, glug of whiskey, which you can see in the lower left corner there. That guy's looking pretty happy. Oops, sorry. Um, uh, then, you know, anything to sort of help lubricate your choice uh, on ballot day. And then you'd be asked to sort of how you wanted to vote and you would declare your preference out loud. The candidate would often be there in person and he would usually stand up and thank you. So this system was called viva voce and it was used by the Greeks before paper along with other simple methods like raising your hand or lining up on opposite sides of the room. These systems worked fine for small communities but as the country grew, the scale became harder to manage. So let's look at some ballots. The meat of what I'm showing today is basically like a 70 year span from the 1820s or so until like the turn of the century. Um, it should be said also that ballots by their nature shouldn't really exist. In fact, they're like legally required to be destroyed. So those that survived have been called by one collector as the most fugitive ephemera, which I love that, that term. Um, so when you went to vote in the early 1800s, you weren't given an official ballot printed by the government to mark your choice. Instead, you may have filled out something like this, which is just like a piece of paper that was printed uh, before and the printer would handwrite your preference in. This was from 1827. Um, or you were handed a bunch of smaller ballots like these, which were pre-printed for the voter to submit. So these are the offices printed on one side with the names on the back. And these were folded up in teeny, teeny, teeny little slips. Um, so I keep hearkening back to the early days because it's fundamentally so, so different from what we know as voting today. So back then there was no government issued ballots, as I mentioned, there was no regulations of what it looked like or how they were even produced. So as the electorate grew, you know, it was no longer smaller country communities. It was easier for the states and the municipalities to have the parties print their own ballots. The parties would also pay for production, the parties would distribute them. And you can imagine the crazy amount of power and control that allowed the parties to, um, to wield. So basically, you know, putting the foxes in charge of the electoral hen house, I've said, uh, with no federal oversight. So, and if you didn't know who you were voting for, parties had manned booths to persuade the voters on their way to um, the polling station. You see the offer of free whiskey again, it's kind of a theme. Um, but the tickets that they were handing out listed all the candidates for their party. You could only vote what they called a straight ticket. So it demanded like full loyalty to a party all the way down. But it was also a heyday for printers back then who were left, left to their own devices to typeset ballots. Uh, and here are some examples from like 1870s. You can see the variety between the tickets. And lots of ballots had emblems or signifiers at the top. They were used both as a party brand as well as a device to help less literate voters. You know, it's easier to say vote for the ship rather than the weird sort of Dr. Seuss-like tree or the chicken. 
but there was some consistency uh, rendered in different styles due to like the printer sorts that were available to different people. Um, so these variations on the arm and hammer represent the Labor Party. Uh, there's a slogan in the middle saying, be just and fear not, which I feel like is a, some, Trey should design a tattoo for us for now. Um, but some ballots had more blatant messages on them. These are two temperance ballots from the 1870s that show the evils of drink in the form of different fathers coming home to their families. One says, out of the grog shops come woe, misery, and death. Um, other ballots had more shocking illustrations. Here are some examples of ballots for parties based on explicitly anti-immigration and anti-Chinese platforms, mostly coming out of San Francisco, um, calling for the protection of white labor. You can see the, um, the coolie getting the boot from the Workers' Party on the upper right, and down you see the sort of like Halloween um, specters lining the door there. Um, this ballot is sort of one of my favorites. It was for C.C. O'Donnell, who was the president of the anti Cooley Club in San Francisco. Um, he promised to run out all the Chinese within the first 24 hours of gaining office. And I know this type of graphics crowd will particularly appreciate the irony of having his header typeset in what could be called early chopsticks. Um, so while the ballots were given out to voters with no need to make any selections or markings, not everyone played by those rules. We are Americans, after all. Um, so you start seeing examples of ballots where voters are really using it as a direct form of expression and as a tool for protest. So this one is from Mississippi uh, around 1880, I believe, a few years after Lincoln was assassinated and during the Reconstruction period. So you can see how he put a line through every option on the ballot, uh, you know, for Constitution, against Constitution, every single name gets replaced. So it was, you know, his way of, you know, giving a handwritten middle finger to the administration. And in a way, this is the first example of an early example of like what that write in part of the ballot that you're always like, what do I do with this? That's where you say like, you know, F you to whatever you want to do or put in your own choice. So I think that's an interesting uh, carryover from what we see today. Um, so the number of offices also were growing. Things were transitioning from appointments to elected offices and the number of candidates who were throwing their hat in the ring required voters to finally like indicate who they selected. So here are some examples of what are called scratched ballots. Um, you know, we think hanging chads were confusing. Check this out, the election rules varied so much that sometimes you put a line through the person you didn't want, sometimes you had to put a line through the person you did want. So talk about confusing. Um, so marking your own ballot was one thing, but there were other modifications that candidates could use to get their name on the ballot but didn't make it on the final printed piece. So one kind of common tactic were these small slips of paper called pasters that had gummed adhesive on the back and were sent to voters or available at the polls. And these were like very small. Um, and your examples of some like literally manhandled ballots, uh, you know, cut and pasted and worked over. And you could see the effort needed to like submit this as an accurate record of your intent. Um, so I was looking at these and then seeing ballots like these um, but, you know, when I came across this one from 1870, I realized, like, why was Edward Flaherty's name so bonkers looking? Then I saw that when you put these two things together, you can see that not only was typesetting on a curve unusual for the way that the layouts were tending towards, but that that design decision kind of served as like a typographic countermeasure for any efforts to write or paste over the name. Um, but then you start seeing it recurring in other ballots where, you know, these are ornamentally pleasing and are not outside of uh, the tenor of that age, but also they could have served as like a typographic defense against writing in a candidate's name in the open space. So you have this one with the really intricate filler that fills in the space or this background that's barely legible, but it's certainly designed as like a deterrent. Uh, and here's an incredibly dense lithographic ballot from 1864. It's jam-packed, including offices for electors, down to the sheriff and the coroner. I can only imagine if somebody came in with a typo or anything having to redraw that plate. So keep in mind different factors when you look at how these ballots were produced. The 1800s is a time of industrial revolution, steam power, railroad system. These advances were all directly affecting printing and the production methods as well. So things like chemical innovations, allowing inks to be mass produced, that was a huge shift. Paper went from being produced from rags, which were getting to be in short supply, to being made from wood pulp, which at that time was endless as a resource. So imagine this combination of faster, cheaper methods of printing, broader distribution networks, a growing population with more time on their hands, so they, they're not farming as much, 
and there's plenty of politics for entertainment. So that's the scene you have to keep in mind as you look at how these ballots then develop. So mass manufactured inks I mentioned, but so innovations like petroleum processing and new chemical formulas made it even more vibrant for these color inks to be produced and also more stable. And you look at these today and they are fresh as a daisy. It's pretty amazing. Um, this is a good example of an engraved ballot from Virginia. Um, these are a variety of hues. Uh, note how the emblems are the same on the ones that are flanking the center one, but lovely palette there. Uh, and these printed in colored stock. You know, again, it's not just to be like a design choice per se, although they're very pleasing to look at. Um, but you know, a bright yellow ballot would be much easier for someone watching uh, someone cast their vote on election day than something that's just like a plain white piece of paper. This is a great example of a gang sheet that would be cut up and distributed at the polls. I really enjoy the variety of ZB Vance's name, typeset in a variety of fonts here. Um, or this lithographic print with hand lettering in two colorways, one using yellow as like a second color. You know, it's hard, no one had any answers about why these looked that way. It was sort of me trying to sort of forensically speculate on why that might be. I mean, the extra yellow may have been an extra deterrent for people producing um, counterfeit ballots or ballots that look very similar because the whole idea, they're all trying to like play the voter. So I think that's something to keep in mind when the question of like, why do they look like this? Because there is definitely an intent. Um, this is one of my favorite ones, it's sort of like letterpress gone crazy. Uh, and these next few are really sort of really the need of it. Um, these two are from 1878 and it kind of blew my mind when I saw it. It's a multicolor print that was uh, likely used on a, made on a chromatic press, but it's like really precise. So it's not like a split fountain necessarily. You know, it's still open for speculation about why it was printed. Maybe it was, um, you know, make ready as a test or something because no one would really spend that much effort on a ballot, which was meant to be thrown away. Um, but this one and this one um, were great fun to like bring it to letterpress printers and have everyone kind of speculate on um, how it was produced. Um, a lot of the ballots were, you know, business on the front, but party on the back as well. You know, why not use that available real estate? So here's an example of the front and the back, you know, we're showing like polls open and close. Um, and these are just some backs that I just think are beautiful. So I don't really have anything to say about them specifically. Um, that one's pretty awesome. So again, another thing to consider is the number of people with voting rights are expanding dramatically during the 19th century. You know, which then came with it, you know, incredibly intense partisanship, which sounds familiar to us now. But there was a mind boggling number of political parties and splinter groups that went well beyond our current two party system. So, you know, we know Democrats, we know Republicans, but you know, the Democrat Republicans, the Free Soilers, the Pe People's Party, the Know Nothings. You may have heard this sort of wafting about in like eighth grade history class, but uh, each one of those, imagine they had a ballot. So there was a lot of ballots and a lot of elections. And here are just some that are, um, you know, the cactus ticket, anyone? The United Anti-Boss ticket slaying the many-headed beast. It was so much more uh, colorful. And then, you know, consistently home rule for America, that kind of um, jingoism was common. Um, so imagine lots of voters, lots of parties, lots of elections. Along with it comes a lot of corruptions and often violence, which was, you know, and you know, sometimes deliberately staged to deter less than stalwart voters. Here's an image from Harper showing violence at the polls. But, you know, this is the time of Boss Tweed. You know, it's like the Martin Scorsese movie where there's lots of like stupendously colorful tales of fraud. I mean, they're kind of amazing where newly arrived immigrants were naturalized en masse and then walked directly to the polls. You have, you know, really ingenious methods of ballot box stuffing, voter impersonation. Uh, one of my favorite stories just quickly is voting by whiskers where you could get five votes out of one man if he started the day with a beard and then ended it clean shaven. So you can kind of imagine the progression. Um, so things were just getting out of hand and there was like a tremendous call for reform and this is like 1860s or so. Um, so enter Australia. The Australian ballot system was actually adopted in Tasmania in 1859. But the big deal about this format is this. The production and distribution were regulated by the government. So suddenly you had an official ballot where you hadn't had one before. Um, the candidate choices were consolidated onto one ballot instead of many. And this ballot was cast in secret. 
So it wasn't a huge hit when it was introduced. You think that makes so much sense now. But people thought it was cowardly to hide your ballot choice. Parties were worried that consolidating the, the offices would vex the voter. Um, so this radical shift in layout also made for some radically different looking ballots, like this one, um, a ballot from 1900. And yeah, look at the down ticket races. Like you're so exhausted by that time. It's crazy. So, you know, this is going from a radical shift of public ballot casting to private. And, you know, voter participation, because it demanded such a high level of patience and knowledge and literacy, participation precipitously dropped. So that's also saying another thing. It's a lot harder to do this ballot than get a slug of whiskey and put it in the box as it was before. Um, so this only gained traction uh, around 1908 when Taft was uh, president. But, you know, a lot of states were kind of like very slow to adopt. Um, variations on the layout began to emerge. This is 1906 group by office offering a straight party option on the left. So it allows you to still just sort of tick the box and move on. Here's a ballot organized by office, but you see the we emblems next to the names are affiliated with more than one party. So they fill all the empty space with dingbats so you don't get um, people doodling. This one is super weird and um, geometric showing affiliations and how candidates that represented one party would be like, I'm the triangle party and I'm the square party. Um, so emblems start appearing again as a way to identify your party and vote a straight ticket. Um, so it was also used in aid for less literate voters. This is sort of more like what we may be familiar with. But things became officially absurd when I came this state, uh, came across this ballot from 1912. It's 14 feet long, people. It's crazy. It's 600 names organized by committees. And a lot of it is like, why? Why this ballot? I think they were sort of trying to say that, like, okay, you want these rules, we're going to, you know, we'll do it by the rules, but it's sort of like, it's not really thinking of the voter and casting the ballot and how that can work. Um, so after this, there was a movement for the short ballot movement. And then, you know, late 1800s, you got the telephone, the light bulb, the automobile, everybody's so excited about the machine and the faith in technology. And, you know, they were like, ah, oh, voting machines, the perfect solution to protect against fraud, since you don't have these unreliable, dishonest humans counting the ballot. Does it all sound familiar, our faith in technology? So this is a voting booth from 1889. And basically, I'm winding it up to the race over the 20th century because it's not exciting to look at, but I have to end on the infamous butterfly ballot of 2000. Um, many people more remember this as a ballot uh, with so much fraud, but it was used as a punch card and the yellow strip is the center, you can see the stylus. Um, so, you know, a vote for Gore could easily be counted as Pat Buchanan. But it's basically a reminder to say that while the old ballots are amazing, beautiful artifacts, artifacts of the history of democracy, the themes they represent are still with us. You know, they're still confusing, they're still hard to mark, they're not to mention voter suppression, electoral fraud, undermining our faith and in the integrity of the system. So I'm gonna end with a quote, I'm gonna read it to you, not in full, but Alexis de Tocqueville almost 200 years ago wrote that while the democracy as we practice it does not give people the most skillful government, it produces what he called a super abundant energy that despite unfavorable circumstances can produce wonders. So clearly we are facing some unfavorable circumstances. The upcoming election will no doubt be aggravating and messy and difficult and contested, but let us use our power as citizens and power of the ballot to produce wonders. Thank you for tuning in. And this is the book. I'll shill it now. Don't get on Amazon, please. Try to support smaller uh, bookstores. So that's that.